Um, fortunately, a lot of the comments that I wanted to, to make to preface this and start off, Catherine just made in terms of the potential for cultural heritage and archaeology to address mitigation and a better understanding of, of uh, climatic events. So um, I can just basically say what she said and then move on to address the more particular points that I'd like to um, with the case of uh, El Nino, Southern Oscillation, and particularly um, warm El Nino events uh, causing abrupt climatic changes um, on Peru's north coast as kind of a case study uh, in both archaeology and remote sensing. Um, so during uh, January to March of this past year, 2017, um, very anomalous high amounts of rainfall hit the normally hyper-arid Peruvian coast. Um, this is one of the most recent in a series of warm or positive ENSO phases that's commonly referred to as El Nino. Um, and this created uh, this anomalous rainfall, a lot of flooding, which you see several <coughs> images of here, both from uh, 2017, as well as in earlier events dating back to 1997 and 1982 and 1983, um, with loss of life, loss of property, destruction to infrastructure, including the Carretera Panamericana that you see here. Um, and these are the disastrous effects of El Nino that we, that we frequently hear about and that we frequently think about. Um, one of the issues that I'm interested in then is trying to get a better grasp over how do these effects vary spatially and temporally. Um, is there uh, different upsides to the downside of El Nino events? Um, how might we gain some insight in terms of potential mitigation or relief strategies from this as well as the potential for archaeology to be applied to these problems? Um, and that's what I'd like to address for you here today. Um, when we're dealing with climactic research, our approaches typically are either through a modeling approach, looking particularly at future events um, based on controlled parameters, or historical reconstructions through paleoclimactic uh, uh, strategies like ice core or paleontological work. Um, and my feeling is that archaeology and cultural heritage has quite a strong potential role in informing better models on both sides, both in terms of future um, prognostication, as well as in really refining our understanding of the human elements, the human dimensions of historical research. Um, climate change has a long history, particularly in, in this region, uh, in terms of archaeological research, but it has yet to really have its full potential realized um, in the uh, various climate sciences uh, that we typically go to. So the particular case study that I want to look at here is Peru's Chicama Valley. Um, it's located in La Libertad, on the north coast of Peru, on the Pacific coast of South America. And we have, from various different projects that have taken place over the years, approximately um, 2,000 archaeological sites that go back from the terminal Pleistocene um, up until uh, the historic colonial period and, and into modern land use, which we can really uh, take advantage of to look at these various issues. Um, and so for those of you who are not familiar with El Nino, let's see if this will work for us. It says it is. Is that large enough to see it? Oh. Um, what you have is a stalling of normal oceanic currents in the eastern Pacific, southern hemisphere, eastern Pacific, where the cold current uh, that normally comes up from Antarctica drops, the thermocline deepens, and you have a warming of equatorial waters that backs up against Peru and southern Ecuador um, and causes anomalous amounts of atmospheric moisture, i.e. rainfall, precipitation that hits this hyper-arid coast. And that also has cascading effects for uh, on southern North America and eastern North America as well. Um, we have approximately 150 years worth of ENSO reconstructions through instrumental and um, archival records. And there are three uh, El Nino events, the first in 1982 and 1983, the next in 1997, 1998, and the most recent one, from which I'll be referring to. And these um, three events are the strongest uh, on record in approximately the past, let me check my notes, um, since the 20th century. So they really give us an idea of what's happening during um, the uh, these extreme climatic disturbances that last for anywhere between uh, 16 months to, to 24 months. Um, fortunately, the most recent El Ninos also coincide with our period of Earth observation science, i.e. satellite remote sensing, which is what I'll be talking about here today. And you can get from these two before and after images a, a brief sense of how dramatic ecological changes are to Peru's normally hyper-arid coast. 
So what you have is a valley oasis in a very, very dry desert. Um, this is a situation that's analogous to the Near East or South Asia or North Africa, for those who are not familiar with this region. But um, following the El Nino rains, you see some dramatic environmental changes, including coastal, uh, coastal turbidity, excuse me, um, uh, which is beyond what I'm going to talk about here today. But then overbank flooding, river avulsion, um, very much enhanced green growth in these desert areas, as well as in agricultural fields. Um, and then the development of certain kind of groundwater features, which are very important, I think. Um, in order to really get at this issue, what I'm using is a Sentinel-2 family of satellites. These are Earth observation satellites, which are sponsored by the European Space Agency. And thank you, Europe, for continuing to support basic Earth observation science. We don't have that <laughs> in the United States so much anymore. <laughs> um, and really what this gives us the ability to do is, is map things that are visible and intuitive, like more plants that we can see. Um, but then also to take advantage of non-visible phenomena in the infrared spectra, um, particularly the uh, near infrared where vegetation is very sensitive and the shortwave infrared where water is very sensitive to make visible stuff that aren't apparent to us um, with the naked eye. And so we can see very briefly um, some land cover changes, which um, I will address um, in more detail um, from the list that we had a couple slides back. I want to look particularly at um, river avulsion or flooding, where that happens and what the implications are of that. Also, the development of vegetation, uh, land cover changes in these uh, hyper-arid desert areas, these desert margins that are beyond modern limits of land use, um, as well as development of groundwater features kind of in the talus or toes of uh, these regions. So the first, excuse me, um, over, blank, over bank flooding, uh, what we commonly think of as El Nino-related disasters, has a very profound impact on infrastructure. Things like irrigation canals, drinking water sources, sanitation infrastructure are devastated by these. Um, but one thing that we can find that we realize is that uh, through remote sensing, the area that's impacted by this flooding is actually relatively well constrained. Um, we're looking at about a one and a half kilometer buffer on either side of the main river channel. Um, to the point where when you drive down the Parra Terracana Americana now, a place where the bridges have been restored, you actually have these signs that say you are entering the Zona Afectada por El Nino. So basically you can describe a zone um, of direct impacts, the most obvious impacts. And while I don't want to minimize these, I think we can look beyond this Zona Afectada to get a better picture perhaps of some of the other um, impacts and is there a kind of a proverbial silver lining to this El Nino rain cloud. Um, and so if we look at archaeology, we see a couple different uh, phenomena. First, most archaeological settlement is outside of that one and a half kilometer buffer, so perhaps they were attuned to something which we've since lost some sort of sensitivity to in the past. Um, but then certain kinds of infrastructure, as in the modern case, are very, very, very sensitive. So if we plot all archaeological pronouns and different kinds of land use that would have been happening downstream, you see that water sources, water infrastructure, is incredibly vulnerable to these flooding events. Basically, the canal intakes are in the areas um, that are most directly impacted, excuse me, by the overbank flooding that happened both in 1997 and, and, and in 2017. Um, if we look then at the ecological changes uh, that are happening in the margins, we see other kinds of potential. So we have here the time series of vegetation growth in desert areas, and this is providing a resource that helps to mitigate and buffer the devastating effects of flooding right along the rivers. Um, the instrument that I'm using to look at, or the metric rather, is something called SAVI. I won't go into details. But what you can see here is between November and October, you have this green growth in the desert areas, um, which provides a whole potential for agricultural production and basically vegetation resources uh, that you don't necessarily have in the valley bottom. So here, if we compare that time series um, vegetation productivity, we can see that one of these desert areas, which I have just designated um, area of interest for, uh, produces as much green growth between the mon months of late February into early June as a modern irrigated sugarcane field. This is sugarcane monoculture here. So the potential for productivity on that order of magnitude is, is quite impressive. Um, we also see in these desert margin areas development of different groundwater sources and the color is perhaps a little bit washed out here but again in April you can see uh, infrared anomaly in the short wave infrared as well as a thermal band anomaly here in an area called the Pampa Macan which corresponds to AOI4 that we just saw um, and, and that is a groundwater source that was utilized 
in bioarchaeological cultures. This area is covered in agricultural fields um, from two different periods, about 3500 BP as well as 1200 AD. Um, and we have archaeological evidence that these types of uh, small water sources were utilized in the past. Groundwater here is sustained at least for 10 months um, as before coming here and have a time to put it into this slide, um, but it's looking at most recent imagery uh, a year after the El Nino, and these ephemeral springs are still flowing. There's still a lot of groundwater that's available there. Archaeological evidence indicates that they were being used in the past um, and that they could have sustained certain kind of carnivorous species like mice and what have you, white-tailed deer, other large herbivores, as well as agricultural production for up to three or four years after these El Nino events. So while you're having very detrimental impacts to water resources and infrastructure down the valley bottoms, you have alternative water sources and, and resources in these highlands. Ethnohistorical and ethnographic evidence confirms this, um, where people are setting up these small-scale agricultural fields um, and they're growing different cultivars uh, like cabbages, pumpkins, and corn, um, which have very demanding nutritional requirements, water requirements, as, long as, very, as well as very long growing uh, um, periods. So up to uh, about 240 days in the case of cassava. And the yields for these things are about 80% what they would have in an irrigated field down the valley bottom. So while it might be not the best scenario, it is actually a pretty productive scenario to be using these things. Um, and if we look at where they are spatially, again, the kind of spatial concern here, we see is that these archaeological sites, quite a number of them, lie outside of the extent of modern cultivation and modern land use. So while we're having these negative impacts right along the river margins, there are possibilities, again, for, for basically making lemons out of lemonade in the case of El Nino. This gives you a sense of what happens to those hyper-arid regions after these rains. Um, there's a flush of vegetation, uh, that can itself be used, but this is again being fed by groundwater resources in, in these springs that, that are quite stable over the, the intermediate term. Um, so, uh, different conclusions. There's a lot of text that uh, basically is our, want to summarize the points that we made already. We've got these different effects. Um, these effects have different longevity, um, but that if we think that it's plausible that and so events could be predicted by certain bioclimatic indicators in addition to modern instrumental means like the El Nino indices that I showed at the very beginning. We could anticipate these effects. We could establish a lot of, of uh, strategies for, for making, um, taking advantage of these water resources that would help to buffer those main uh, detrimental impacts um, to groundwater, excuse me, to, to irrigation and sanitation infrastructure um, in uh, the valley bottoms. Okay, thank you very much to the conference organizers um, and thank you again to the European Space Agency. It's a great resource.